Have your Bibles open, please, to the second epistle of John, that little one-page, one-chapter epistle uh, by John the Apostle. Now, we, we, we begin by looking at the beginning and John identifying himself as the elder of, that is writing this epistle to another group of believers. Now, I would encourage you throughout all of this study to keep your Bible open and follow word for word. You'll get far more from it if you will do that. Now, John says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. Now, he identifies himself as an elder. The word elder and presbyter are the same Greek word, and that is the job description of the office or the position. Now, the word bishop and overseer is the same Greek word, and that is a job description. The word pastor or shepherd is the same Greek word, and that is also a job description. So he defines himself as an elder, and John was one of the elders of the church in Jerusalem, James, Peter, and John being the chief elders. Now the elder to, not unto, but to an elect lady. The article is added by the translators. So it's the elder to an elect lady. Now the word elect is the Greek word electe. And that word simply means chosen, under the chosen lady. Now the word lady is not an individual female that John is addressing himself to because the word lady is the word kuria, which is the dative feminine singular form of the word kurios, which is the word Lord. So we have the Lord and the lady. Uh, Christ and his church. Now remember the word church, ecclesia, is a feminine word. And so we find here that this is the Lord and the Lady, Christ and his church. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 1 and 2, we find there that a local church is the Lady or the Bride of Christ. Now notice what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. Would to God ye would bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, uh, or I'm jealous over you with the jealousy of God, for I have espoused you, and he's talking to the church at Corinth. He is speaking to the assembly there. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So we see then that uh, the church is, uh, is a feminine word. Uh, it is the word ecclesia, and so John is addressing himself here to an assembly of believers and not just to a lady. Some of the things that are said in this epistle will not be appropriate to be said to a lady. Now, elder unto the chosen uh, lady and her children. Now, not offsprings of a woman, but those who are the children of God in the assembly, and that is pointed out for us very well by the word whom I love in the truth. The word whom is a plural word, and it's masculine, a masculine plural word. Now, all believers in an assembly are referred to as the children are the sons of God, whether male or female, they're referred to in the scripture as the sons of God. Now, he says, he's addressing himself to some church and assembly that is in some close proximity to Jerusalem where John is serving uh, as an elder. So he says, and her children whom I love, I highly value in the realm or sphere of truth or of the spirit. Now, Notice he goes on to say, and not I only, I'm not the only one that loves or highly values those children of that assembly, but also all they that have known the truth. Now notice here, have known is a perfect participle, having known and knowing, those who are having known and continuing to know the truth. Now notice the word truth here. In back just one page in your Bible to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6, and we find that John, throughout all of his writings in the gospel as well as the three epistles, uses the word truth and spirit somewhat synonymously. They are interchangeably used by him. Now, in 
1 John 5, 6, he says this, uh, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So the spirit and truth are somewhat used interchangeably in John's writings, and we find that in all four of the books of the scriptures which he penned. Now, back to uh, Second John then. So he says, I'm not the only one that highly values uh, these, these believers, but also all those who have known and continuing to know the truth are the spirit. Then he goes on to say, for the truth's sake. Now the word for is not the word gar, which would be for, but it's the word dia, by means of it through the spirit. Now notice the word sake is in italics, that is also added by the translators. It's not uh, because of the truth's sake, but because of the truth, because of the spirit, which dwelleth in us. Now that spirit of God is dwelling in us and shall be with us, or literally, and with us shall be. So this Spirit of God is abiding in us, and with us that same Spirit of truth shall be forever, that is, unto the age. So the Spirit of God is always going to be with us as Christ had promised himself. Then we notice the greeting that John gives to this church and its believers. Grace be unto you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and from the Father in truth and love. Now, notice what he says. Grace be with you, mercy and peace. Literally rendered, that says, shall be with us, grace, mercy, peace. Now, what is grace? We often say grace is that undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor, and that is true, but it's far more than that. It is an undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor that demands no return. Now, the usage of this word grace in the New Testament, secularly, in the secular Greek, it was a word that was used something like this. Here was two young boys that were always good friends and buddies. They grew up together. They came into adulthood still being close friends. And one day, one of them fell into a dire, serious need in his life for which he could do nothing to help himself. But his friend, motivated out of love for him, did him a favor that he had not earned, deserved, or merited in any way. And he did a favor for him to lift him up out of his need, and he did it with no expectation that his friend do a like favor back unto him. Now, when that word is placed into the New Testament, it is elevated to a much higher level. It is no longer a favor which is done for a friend, but a favor which is done for an enemy. By nature and birth, we were at enmity with God, because of the sin which we all committed in Adam back in the Garden of Eden, and we've all been in, at natural enmity with God since that time. But we are in a dilemma for which we could do nothing for ourselves. We're lost, judged, condemned, no way to save ourselves, nor to make ourselves acceptable to God. But God so loved us that he did us a favor that we had not earned, deserved, nor merited in any way by sending his Son, Jesus Christ, to earth, to pay the penalty for our sins so he could lift us from the condemnation and God did it with no expectation that we should ever have to do a like favor back unto him. That is grace. So he says here, uh, shall be with us grace, that favor of God that we do not deserve, and mercy. Now mercy is that which is done to alleviate the miserable, wretched condition of another. It's the kindness and goodwill toward the miserable with a desire to relieve them. And if you show mercy, we have had the mercy of God upon us because of our miserable, wretched, lost condition. He alleviated that and peace. The word peace simply means a binding together. We were separated and alienated from God by sin through Adam and by our very nature. But by the reconciling work of Jesus Christ, we are brought back in the loving relationship and fellowship and bound back together with God rather than being separated and alienated from him. So he says, then shall be with us grace, mercy, and peace. And where does it come from? From God the Father. From God our Father and 
from also from the side of. The word from there in both cases is the word para, from the side of. It comes from the side of God and from the side of the Lord of us, uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ defines who the Lord, the master owner is. And who is he? He's the son of the Father. And Jesus Christ is the son of the Father, and it is in truth and love, in spirit and love that he extends all of this unto us. Now in verse 4, he begins the body of the epistle of what he wants to say. I rejoiced greatly, or literally, I was exceedingly glad that I found, or I have found, of, the word of is ek, out of, out from thy children walking or ordering their behavior in the realm or sphere of truth. Now, he said, it, I, I rejoice greatly that some of your children, that is, some of those from that assembly that he's addressing, they had to come in contact with John there in Jerusalem, so it was somewhere in close proximity. And he says, I've found that a lot of thy children are ordered their behavior in the realm or sphere of truth or in the spirit of God. And, of course, we should all order our behavior and our life by the Spirit of God who dwells within us from the time of our salvation. And uh, so he says, I, I, I was exceedingly glad to see that your children were ordering their behavior in the truth of the Spirit as we have received a commandment from the Father. And the Father commanded that our behavior should be directed by the Spirit of God and we should be in subjection unto him and have his direction in our life. And now... I beseech thee. I, I, I beg of you, uh, please, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now, again, it would have been somewhat in, inappropriate for Paul to, or John, rather, to write to some lady and say, God's commanded us that we love one another. Now, what he's talking about here is believers as a whole in writing to that assembly. So he says, we are to love or to highly value one another. And this is love, that we walk or order our behavior after his commandments or according to his commandments. So we are to love. This is love. Love and a high value on God and fellow man is manifest by ordering our behavior according to the teaching of the Word of God. Now, we find that Christ commanded us to do so. He said it's according to his commandment. Now, this is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Now, Let's go back and look at the commandment of our Lord. The Lord himself gave the command that we have this kind of a love and concern for one another. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 13 and verses uh, uh, 34 and 35, John 13, 34 and 35, the Word of God says this, Christ is speaking, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love, agape, or highly value one another. How much? As I have loved or highly valued you, that ye also love or highly value one another. Now, how much did he love and highly value us? Enough to die for us. And so we as believers should have a concern for one another enough to be able to die for one another. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Now, a disciple is one who learns from and follows after. Now, if we learn from Christ that we're to value others in that sense, and we actually follow in that steps, then we will be known as a disciple of Christ. Now, look a little further in John chapter 14 and verse 15. John 14, 15, Christ is speaking, and he says this, If you love me, if you highly value me, Keep my commandments or my teachings. So if we do highly value the Lord, we'll obey and live by his teachings. Uh, look also in verse 21 uh, of the same chapter. Christ said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So it's an obvious fact that most saved people do not really love the Lord because love is manifest by obedience to the teaching of the word of God. Now, in our modern day, we have come to equate loving the Lord as being saved, but being saved and loving the Lord is not the same thing. 
uh, you can be saved, but if you highly value or love the Lord, you will be living and ordering your life by the teachings of the Word of God. Drop down a little further to verse 23. Here the Word says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me or highly values me, he will keep my words. He will live by those. Also in John chapter 15, in verses 12 through 14, notice Christ is speaking there also. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, how much? As I have loved you. There it is again. That we are to love others as Christ loved us, and he loved us enough to give himself for us. He goes on to say, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest love you can have, is to lay down your life for someone else. And Christ says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Therefore, if you lay down your life for others, you've laid it down for Christ, and you are his friend as well. Verse 17 of chapter 15. Christ said, these things I command you, that you love or highly value one another. Uh, also, we can see that John said more about this, even over in, in his first epistle, uh, over in his first epistle, chapter 5, and verses 2 and 3. First John, chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, he had something more to say about this. Uh, here he tells us also that we are to love one another and it is made manifest by our obedience to the word of God. In the first epistle of John, chapter 5 and verses 2 and 3, here the word says, By this we know that we love the children of God. Now we can know that we love one another as the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, if we highly value God and keep his commandments, then we are loving one another. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Some people think it's such a grievous, hard thing to have to live by the word of God. But he says here, very clearly they're not grievous, and if we consider them to be, then there's something amiss in our life as a child of God. Also, back in the book of Romans, chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10. Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10, the word of God uh, says this. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Now, I'm not to be indebted to anyone for anything except to love them. What that means is that they show such a high value and love me that I feel indebted to value them, and I highly value others that they feel indebted to value me. So he says, Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love fulfills the entire law of God. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and any other commandment that there be. You see, if I highly value someone and love them, I'm not going to commit adultery with them. I'll not kill them, I'll not steal from them, I'll not bear false witness against them, I'll not covet what they have. And he says, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, quote, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. James 2.8 says that's the royal law of all scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, and it's quoted over and over throughout the New Testament. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If you highly value God and fellow man, you have fulfilled the entire law of God. Every law that we find in the word of God has to do with either highly valuing God, obeying and living for him, or highly valuing others, and treating fellow man right and properly. So love is the fulfilling of the law. Agape, now love is not a feeling, it's not a mushy emotion, but the word agape refers to how highly we value God or how highly we value others. So we find that we are to highly value, and he says keeping those commandments is what God would have us to do. Then over in Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 6. 
Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, the Word of God says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but what does? But faith which worketh by love. Have all the faith you want and believe all you want, and if there's no love, it's not going to accomplish anything. Faith only works by love. And then, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and the first three verses, we have a, an astounding statement here made by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God concerning love. He said, Though I speak, though is a third-class conditional clause, and coupled with I speak, which is in the subjunctive modes, means that grammatically this is a supposition. Suppose that I should speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Not saying I can, but suppose I should speak with the, the, the tongues and the languages of all people and even the angelic language and have not charity or agape, or that's the word rendered love, and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I'm a sound that means nothing. And though I have the gift of prophecy, I can make known all of the word and the will of God, and I'm, suppose I understand all mysteries, suppose I understand everything God has ever revealed, and suppose I understand all knowledge, I know everything there is to be known. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, he's not saying he can, he says suppose that that should be. And have not love, I am nothing. You see, we think sometimes that people have all these gifts and abilities, they're great people or something, but God says if you have all of that without love, you are nothing. In the first case, you're a meaningless sound. You're a sound that means nothing. In the second case, you are nothing. Then verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I liquidate all that I have, and I use it to feed poor people, which is a commendable thing to do, and though I give my body to be burned, I give myself up as a martyr and have not love. If I do it only for self-satisfaction, if I do not do it because of love of God and a fellow man, it profiteth me nothing. There is no reward for it. So, he's talking about the love here that we are to manifest unto others. Now, back to our text in the little epistle of Second John. Now, notice here in verse 6, he says, This is love that we order our behavior according to his commandments, and this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. That is, ye should walk in love. Now, here when he says ye should walk in it, that's a second uh, person, plural, present, active, subjunctive. What does that mean? It means you should walk, as it's rendered here. You may, you might not, but you should. That is what we ought to be doing. We should be living and ordering our behavior in that love according to the commandment of Christ. So then John is not saying anything new here, and he said this is not a new commandment, but it's what the, the Lord gave from the beginning in his own earthly ministry, and it's never been retracted. Now, it is very, very vitally important that we order our behavior in the Spirit of God, lest we be deceived. Because it says, For or because many deceivers are entered into the world. Uh, so he says, Many deceivers are entered, or they went forth into the world. Now there are many deceivers, and a deceiver is those who lead to wrong actions as well as wrong opinions. They have the wrong opinion and understanding of things, so therefore it leads to wrong behavior. So that is a deceiver. So because many deceivers went forth into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now let's look at that again. Look at it closely. Who are confessing. That's a present participle. Who are confessing not Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. The word that and the verb is are both added by the translators. So it says, who are confessing not Jesus Christ coming in flesh. Now, come is a present middle participle. It's the word 
coming, Jesus Christ's coming was in the flesh. Now, Jesus Christ's coming in flesh, featuring the incarnation as a continuing fact. He came, he is, he continues to be. That is present tense in Greek. That which is, continues to be without cessation. So what we find here is this, that he's saying that those who do not confess, confess or admit that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, he is now in flesh and he's returning in flesh, he says they are a deceiver and an antichrist. They are teaching contrary to the teaching of Christ. Now notice with me that Christ came in the flesh according to the Gospel of John chapter 1. And the Gospel of one. Gospel of John chapter 1 and the very first verse we find the fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Here he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now notice the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now look down in verse 14. And the Word who was Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who was it that came and dwelt among us? Jesus Christ, who was God. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and we find also not only that he came in flesh, but he is dwelling in flesh now in his glorified body in heaven. He's still dwelling in a body of flesh, according to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. The word says here, For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now this word dwelleth is a present tense verb, which means in him was dwelling, is now, and continues without cessation. That is the usage of present tense in the Greek language. Now notice that this was written some 30 years after Christ had ascended into heaven. And he says, in him has been dwelling, is dwelling now at this time, 30 years later, and will continue to dwell in the flesh. So Christ's coming is in flesh, and those who do not teach that are anti-Christ and have not the Spirit of Christ. But not only that, but we find that Christ is coming back in the flesh when he returns again, he will also come in flesh as we find in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11. Now after the resurrection of Christ, as he was ready to go back into heaven, the apostles were with him. Notice what it says in Acts 1 verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Christ was taken up, and he was received out of their sight into the heavens. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now get what they said. This same Jesus, not another, this same Jesus, which is being taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They saw him go up in a visible, tangible body. He's going to come back again in that same visible, tangible body. Now, back to 2 John chapter 2. So we see here that he says, uh, we are to be ordering our behavior in truth and the spirit of Christ because many deceivers went forth into the world who are confessing not Jesus Christ's coming was in flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. These people are very deceptive who are teaching that Christ was not in the flesh, and there are some who teach his resurrection was not in flesh, that it was a spiritual body, but he was in a body of tangible, physical flesh. He ascended in heaven in that flesh, and he will return again. Those who teach contrary to that are not teaching the Christ of the Bible. Therefore, they are anti, opposed to, the real Christ of God. Therefore, look to yourselves. This word look to is a present active imperative. 
That means, President, you do it, you always do it, and it's imperative, absolutely essential to do it if you want to be right. It means to see to, to beware, to watch out in order to beware. So you be careful and keep on the lookout in order to beware to yourselves. Why that? Hina, a purposive clause. In order that we lose not or we destroy not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive or receive back a full reward. Now, you will not lose any reward for that which you have done, but you can fail to attain a full reward if you allow yourself to be deceived by some of these deceiving false teachers who are anti to the truth of Christ. So he says, you want to be sure that you walk in the Spirit of Christ, not deceived by these, so that you receive a full reward. So whosoever or everyone transgressing, the word transgressus is a present participle. Now transgressing is anyone stepping by the side of or deviating from, anyone going beyond or reasoning by the side of the things of the truth of God. They try to rationalize and reason around these things and justify themselves in what they're doing. So anyone who is transgressing and abiding not in the doctrine of the Christ hath not God. Did you get what that said? Very clear statement. Anyone who is stepping by the side of this truth and they're not abiding, they're not dwelling in the doctrine of the Christ, this doctrine concerning the person of Christ in flesh, he doesn't have God. In other words, he's not saved. And uh, he hath... Uh, he hath not God. Now, that person does not have Christ dwelling within them if they are denying his person. He that abideth or dwelleth in the doctrine of the Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, we must be very careful. Uh, we must never break with the past. The solid Orthodox, sound, basic, fundamental Bible teachings never veer from them. We must never break with the past. Any new truth that we come to understand must be an outgrowth of the old truth, not simply new in itself, but an outgrowth of fuller and more complete understanding of that which has been from the beginning. So a theology which is simply old is simply dead, and a theology which is simply new is simply false. It's that simple. So we must maintain, quote, the teachings of the Christ. Jesus, Christ, came in flesh, is in flesh, and is returning in flesh. Uh, so any teaching that does not accept Jesus Christ as Savior and there is no interpretation of Christianity as true which eliminates redemption or obscures the glory of the cross and the person of Jesus Christ. Now notice what he goes on to say. He said, look to yourselves that we receive, not, receive a full reward and anyone who is stepping by the side of and abiding or dwelling not in this doctrine of Christ hath not God and he that is abiding in the doctrine of the Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you. Now this word if is a first class conditional clause, which means if as indeed it is true, it's been established as a fact. In other words, since. Since there come any unto you. Now there are those who come from time to time. Come, there come is a present tense. They come and they continue to come at times and they have throughout the ages and they still do today. Come knocking on your doors. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ, who came, is, and will be, and return in the flesh. Those who come to you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Now he says, receive him not into your house. The word received is second person plural present active indicative, which means receive ye not 
him. Receive ye not him. So it's not uh, showing him hospitality that is forbidden. We're to be hospitable toward all people. But it's affording him an opportunity to unsettle the faith of the brethren by having him come in and speak. Now, in other words, when he says house here, in the early church, the Jews met in synagogues, but believers, the Christians, did not have church buildings back then. They met in homes. Later, they began to build houses to house their assembly worship, as the Jews had. So he says here, do not accept him into a house. Uh, don't receive him in order to give him encouragement to unsettle the saints about the truth of the person of Christ. So since there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, and receive him not into a house, the word here is added, into a house, that is a house where the believers are assembling. Neither bid him God speed. Don't bid him, bid him a greeting, uh, nor to rejoice with him. Do not wish them success in any way. It's a perfect, uh, in, it's a present infinitive, which means to give greeting. Don't be giving a greeting to him. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. To greet and welcome a false teacher was to express solidarity with them. And so therefore by doing so you become a partaker or a partner, a joint participant of their evil deeds of unsettling the saints and not bringing the doctrine concerning the Christ. The Christ of God who came in flesh is now dwelling in flesh and will continue to be in flesh throughout eternity. Now, the closing of the epistle. He says, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink. Now he said, I have many things that I could say that I could write in this little epistle, but I would not write these things. Now it is easy to lay down general principles, but their application to particular cases is a delicate task demanding knowledge, sympathy, and love. Now, John says here, the things that I want to say, I will not put on paper. But notice what he says. I have many things to say unto you, and, and excuse me, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now when he says face to face, that means mouth to mouth. Now when you go face to face to talk with someone, the sight of their faces appeals to our heart and it softens our speech. You see, when we speak by a distant report about something, we can say, that character ought to be strung up by the toes and bull whipped. I mean, we make statements like that at times, but when you face the individual, it changes the attitude of the heart and the concept. The sight of people's faces appeals to the heart and softens our speech. When one meets with people and talks with them, talks with them about the situation, then one's judgment of them and their opinions of them is often modified. As I said, we must be careful about judging by distant report. It's reported that Dr. Dale of Birmingham, England, was at first inclined to look with disfavor on Mr. D.L. Moody. Uh, and he thought he did not have the right to be preaching the gospel. So one time he went to hear him, and his opinion was totally altered. He regarded ever after with profound respect. And he considered that he had a right to preach the gospel after all, because, quote, he said, because he could not speak of a lost soul, without tears in his eyes, unquote. You see, a man may not be a great theologian in the best of one understanding the details of Scripture and its minute teachings of matters, but he can have a heart for God and the souls of men, and we need to be careful about those judgments. 
So he says, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust, I hope, I anticipate to come unto you and speak and to speak face to face or mouth to mouth that our joy may be full, that we may be having a full joy in all matters there in that assembly where the chosen people are as the children of God. And then he says, the children of thy elect our chosen sister greet thee. So, those of that assembly where John was, who were the children, the sons of God in that place, are sending their greetings back to those of that assembly of the chosen Lord, chosen lady of the Lord, to whom he is addressing. Now, we do not know which assembly this would have been or where, but it, we know that it had to be somewhere within close proximity to Jerusalem where John was an elder in the church. So he says, I greatly rejoice that I found that our children ordered their behavior in the truth and the spirit of God as we have commandment from the Lord that we ought to do, that we're to love and we're to love one another. So he says, you make sure you look to yourself that you're living this way and following in the spirit of God and exercising this love toward God and fellow man because there's many deceivers out there that are not teaching the truth of Christ. So we're to be careful. And if anyone comes to us not bringing that doctrine concerning Christ, you don't bid him well. You don't wish him well and his doings whatsoever because you become a partaker of his evil deeds if you do. And these have not God by not having that position. So he winds up by giving a, a subtle warning in a way to be careful about judging others by distant report because when we face people, our attitudes often change.